The arrival of summer brings memories filled with fun and excitement. Families spend time on picnics, swimming at the beach or pool, fishing or the ballpark, watching fireworks on the 4th of July, or, best of all, spending time at a local amusement park. At one time, Northeast Ohio had a large number of amusement parks. Choices were abundant for the average family in the area. And in this video, we will look at these iconic amusement parks of yesteryear. But before we begin, Please, if you like this video, please click the like button. And please subscribe and hit the notification button, as this will work with the YouTube algorithm and help to grow our channel. First, a little history of the amusement park. For the most part, amusement parks started in the Middle Ages. They began as fairs, the first well-known being the Bartholomew Fair in England, starting from 1133. The fair was an annual three-week event that included games, contests, and the trading of goods. It brought together people from all walks of society. These fairs evolved over time. They became events that involved entertainment such as freak shows, juggling acts, competitions of all types, and various vendors selling their wares. In 1583, Bakken Park, also known as The Hill, opened in Klampenbeth, Denmark. The location of this park was near a natural spring. The spring drew crowds due to its healing properties. With the crowds came entertainment of all kinds. And in 1669, King Frederick III set up an animal park at Bakken. It still is a park and is now considered the oldest amusement park in the world. After that, many amusement parks opened up in Europe, including Vauxhall Gardens in London, Prater in Austria, and Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen, Denmark. One of Tivoli Gardens' first guests was Hans Christian Andersen, who was inspired by his visit when he wrote his short story, Nightingale. Tivoli Gardens also impressed Walt Disney when he took his daughters on a visit, and he based his vision of Disneyland on what he saw there. Amusement parks often first made their homes near water and set up their entertainment around that water. One of these early American parks was Lake Compounce, which opened in 1846 in Bristol and Southington, Connecticut. It is the oldest still-running amusement park in the United States. The second oldest amusement park in the United States was Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio which also opened as a beachfront resort in 1870. We will return to Cedar Point and its proud history later in this video. Another park not in Ohio but with a strong Ohio connection is Coney Island in Brooklyn, New York. Coney Island was at first a summer resort for wealthy New Yorkers, but soon the working and middle class of the surrounding areas flocked to the resort, and its popularity grew exponentially. In 1884, an inventor from Ohio, Lamarcus A. Thompson, built and operated the Switchback, the nation's first roller coaster, debuting at Coney Island. Soon Thompson was building more switchback roller coasters and placing them in amusement parks throughout the United States and the world. During the Industrial Revolution, as the city of Cleveland grew, becoming one of the largest and wealthiest cities in America, the working and middle class populations lived in cramped conditions throughout the city. Many of the citizens of Cleveland lived near train and trolley lines, which gave them easy access throughout the city. These working-class families were earning good wages and found they had money to spend and were itching to do so. This allowed clever businessmen to create amusement parks to grab cash from the city's entertainment-hungry citizens. The first amusement park to open in the city of Cleveland was Forest City Park. It was developed and operated by George William Bayerly and was known initially as Bayerly Park. The park opened in 1893 and was located on one of the busiest trolley lines in the city, along East 55th Street. This and the 15-cent admission made it an instant success. The name changed to Forest City Park in 1894. The park included a lake with a boathouse, a grandstand, a dance pavilion with a skating rink, a small zoo, a merry-go-round, a theater, a shooting gallery, and a bowling alley. But it wasn't a huge amusement park and had limited attractions. As new amusement parks opened up, they just could not compete. It also did not have parking for automobiles as they quickly became the preferred form of transportation instead of the trolley lines. The park was not able to sustain a profit. Then in the 1920s, the park suffered significant damage from a fire. After that, the park closed for good. The baseball park remained on the land for a short while, and then the ground became an excavation site. Eventually, the lake was filled in with dirt, 
Now, it is just a piece of vacant land with no real remnants of the amusement park. Inspired by the initial success of Forest City Park, a group of investors purchased land on the shores of Lake Erie at 156th Street and Nottingham Road. The land was located only 8 miles from the center of town, Public Square, and was accessed easily by the train and trolley. These investors wanted to replicate Coney Island at their new beachside resort. They named their resort Euclid Beach Park. They opened the amusement park in 1894, but they just could not manage it and sold off the park to the Humphrey family in 1901. The Humphrey family added several popular attractions. One of the more popular attractions was the Euclid Beach Carousel. The first rendition debuted in 1905 and was replaced by a newer version in 1910. After the park closed, the carousel first found a home at Palace Playland in Orchard Beach, Maine. It then returned to Cleveland to be placed in a new edition at the Western Reserve Historical Society Museum, where you can go and ride it today. Euclid Beach also had seven roller coasters over the lifetime of the park. The first was the Switchback Railway which debuted in 1896. It was one of Lamarcus A. Thompson's roller coasters. It remained a popular ride until it closed in 1904. The Switchback Railway was followed by the Figure 8 roller coaster and the Scenic Railway, also built by Thompson. The Aero Dips, the Derby Racer, which became the Racing Coaster, and later the Thriller and the Flying Thrills Coaster. The Humphrey family was determined to make Euclid Beach a family-friendly amusement park. They did this by refusing to let anyone who was intoxicated into the park. They made it a rule that only children were allowed to wear shorts while everyone else needed to be appropriately attired. They had a slogan for the park, one fair, free gate, and no beer. Euclid Beach had various events at the park, including a political rally for John F. Kennedy and a flight exhibition that starred famous pilot Glenn Curtis, who flew his plane from Euclid Beach to Cedar Point and then back again. But for all the fun Euclid Beach offered its guests, it also had a darker side. The Humphrey family made a point that no undesirables should attend their park. They felt those who were undesirable, in their opinion, were immigrants and African Americans. Around 1915, Euclid Beach only allowed African Americans into the park on certain days. The park police were in force, making sure that any African American guest, when they were allowed to participate in the park's amusement rides, were not interacting with any of the white guests. This was completely forbidden, and anyone, be it someone who was African American or white, would be escorted out of the park. It remained this way at Euclid Beach Park for around 30 years. For a long while, no one fought back against these harsh and discriminatory rules. That is until July 21, 1946, when an interracial group of young people, decided to go into the park together to test what would happen. They were quickly gathered up, and promptly kicked out of the park, by the park police. This action inspired protests that lasted throughout the summer. People of all races protested in front of Euclid Beach, picketing against their unfair rules. Another interracial group attempted to enter the park in August 1946. An African-American man waiting to pick the group up was stopped and beaten up by the park police. This culminated in an even more violent situation in September 1946, when a scuffle started between two off-duty African-American Cleveland police officers against two Euclid Beach police, ending up with one of the African-American officers being shot in the leg. This event caused the Cleveland City Council to provide legislation requiring the revocation of all licenses of amusement parks if they continued with their racial discrimination. But the positive changes the city of Cleveland implemented, did not help Euclid Beach. The park was steadily losing money. They started selling off their amusement rides to other parks, and this included the Racing Derby Ride, which they sold to Cedar Point, and where it remains a favorite ride in the park to this day. But selling off the rides and attractions was not enough to keep the park afloat, and they decided to cease operations in September 1969. The iconic front entrance still stands, and you can still find remnants of past rides. The location now has large apartment complexes and housing, and the beach, pier, and picnic area remain, and are run by the Cleveland Metro Parks. The neighborhood is now a majority African American community, and the community enjoys the park without hassle or discrimination. It is a beautiful place to visit in the heart of the city. The first amusement park to open on the west side of the city of Cleveland was Puri Tiz Springs Park. Puri Tiz Springs Park opened in 1898. It was located on the north side of Puri Tiz Road overlooking the Rocky River Valley. It was an 80-acre park with a dance hall, roller rink, 
a ball field, and picnic spots. It also had several thrill rides, such as the Cyclone Roller Coaster. Puri Tiz Springs Park was the first park to introduce a horse-drawn and steam-powered carousel in Ohio. The amusement park remained very popular until 1958, when the park changed hands and ceased operations. Then the buildings that remained, caught on fire, and what was left of the park was raised, and new housing developments and shopping centers were put in its place. For a brief time, on the shores of Lake Erie, around East 140th Street near the upscale neighborhood of Brat in All, was a small amusement park by the name of White City Park. It was established in 1900, and was designed by Ed Boyce who was also an owner of Coney Island's Dreamland. It was first named Manhattan Beach, but the park name was soon changed to White City Park. The park was built in only 11 weeks, and the idea was to bring in attractions, entertainers and celebrities to draw people into the park. The park featured a boardwalk, a shoot the shoots water ride, the Bostock Animal Show which included a popular lion tamer, a midway and a scenic railway. The park, strangely enough, included an infant incubator, showcasing this new kind of technology from some of the Cleveland area physicians. The first baby was put into one of the incubators in June 1905, and the incubators in the hospital that supported them gained notoriety from this incredible life-preserving technology. They even had reunions for the children who were placed in these incubators, which lasted several years. But, in the end, Cleveland did not have the celebrity or star power to entice people into the park, plus unlike the other parks of the day, White City Park charged an admission fee. Then in 1906, a fire destroyed several buildings in the park. They rebuilt, and were able to open back up in 1907. But that summer, a freak storm with high gale winds, wiped out the amusement park, and it closed its doors forever in 1907. The land then became a picnic and beach area for a few years. Later becoming the location for the sewage treatment plant that served the east side of Cleveland. In 1905, Luna Park opened up and was instantly Euclid Beach's biggest inner-city competitor. Luna Park was located on a 35-acre site on Woodhill Road, East 110th Street, Woodland Avenue, and Ingersoll Avenue. Luna Park was considered Cleveland's fairy tale of pleasure. It was created by Fred Ingersoll, who was a famous builder of amusement park rides. The grounds of Luna Park had magnificent architecture, with buildings that were in the Italian Renaissance, Egyptian, Gothic and Japanese styles. These unique buildings lined the midway and were lit at night by incandescent bulbs. There was also a pool in the center of the midway. Luna Park had a variety of exciting rides, including a Ferris wheel, a carousel, a water ride, the Jack Rabbit, and the Pippin roller coaster. It had a fun house, a dance hall, and a roller rink, and on its stage played vaudevillian shows, operas, and plays. Luna Park was famous for its availability of beer. The purchase of beer was their primary source of revenue but that income was completely cut off during the time of Prohibition. Though they tried to overcome this loss of income by adding new attractions, it did not help, and it wasn't enough to save the park. Ultimately Luna Park had to close in 1931. The roller rink stayed open a few more years, but even that attraction, closed in 1938. Cleveland was not alone when it came to popular amusement parks. Several other areas in Northeast Ohio joined in on the fun. Chippewa Lake Park was located at Chippewa Lake in Medina, Ohio. It opened in 1898. The boom years for the park were during the 1920s when they added the first modern coaster called the Big Dipper. The park also included live bands that played seven days a week. The park would eventually have three roller coasters, a flying cages ride, a Ferris wheel, the tumble bug ride, and a carousel. The park managed to stay open for 100 years before finally having to close in 1978, after years of struggling financially. The park remained abandoned for quite a while, with the old rides just rotting away. The park's abandoned state made it a great location, when Hollywood used it in the 2010 horror film, Closed for the Season. Shady Lake Park was a small amusement park run by the Euclid Beach Park Humphrey family. Shady Lake Park opened in Streetsboro, Ohio, in 1978 and closed its doors in 1982. Most of the rides at Shady Lake Park were once part of Euclid Beach Park. Now, where the park once stood, are the Shady Lake Apartments and a bank. Summit Beach Amusement Park opened in 1880 at Summit Lake, in Akron, Ohio. It was once called Akron's Million Dollar Playground because of the very wealthy that came to relax on the beachfront. In the 1920s, it was the highest-grossing amusement park in Northeast Ohio. 
Summit Lake Park had a ballroom with the world's largest dance floor that could hold up to 5,000 people. The ballroom had major entertainment draws, including Sally Rand, the famous burlesque dancer known for her feather and bubble dances. It was also the location where the Mensches brothers operated their restaurant. The Mensches brothers invented the Hamburg sandwich in 1917. Summit Lake Park also installed the first commercial monorail in the country. The monorail was eventually moved to Cedar Point. After years of urbanization of Akron's inner city communities, Summit Lake Park could no longer stay in business, and shut down in 1958. Geauga Lake opened in 1887 in Aurora, Ohio. Geauga Lake was initially known as Picnic Lake or Giles Pond. It opened first for swimming and picnics in 1872, and in 1888, the park held three major league baseball games on its baseball field. Then in 1889, they installed their first ride, a steam-powered carousel, followed soon by its first roller coaster, the Big Dipper. They also installed an Olympic-sized pool at the park. And on July 11, 1926, Olympic medalist and Tarzan actor Johnny Weismuller set a new world record in the 220-yard freestyle swim, doing this feat in front of 3,000 spectators. Giaga Lake then added a dance hall, where prominent band musicians such as Guy Lombardo, Fred Waring, and Artie Shaw played. In 1969, Funtime Corporation purchased the park. It focused mainly on bringing in more rides and attractions to the park. In 1970, SeaWorld built a marine park across the lake from Giaga Lake. The two amusement parks were amiable neighbors for over 30 years. The lake in between the two parks would be their connection, with Giaga Lake using the lake for different amusement rides, and SeaWorld using it for water shows. In 1972, Giaga Lake added its Gold Rush Flume Ride and the Skyscraper Ride. The Skyscraper Ride took passengers up 21 stories above the park. It became a familiar focal point of the park. Up until 1972, admission to the park was free, with attendees only paying for rides on a pay-as-you-go plan. But in 1973, Giaga Lake established a pay-one-price admission fee, with the ability to ride as much as you wanted the entire day. Giaga Lake became the first amusement park in Ohio to have two looping roller coasters. In 2000, Giaga Lake was bought by Six Flags. Six Flags included new themed rides, like Batman, Night Flight, and Superman, The Ultimate Escape. At this time, SeaWorld, owned by Bush Entertainment, was looking to add roller coasters to all of its theme parks. They decided to approach Six Flags to buy Giaga Lake. Instead, Six Flags gave them a counteroffer, which they accepted. Six Flags bought SeaWorld for $110 million. They kept the SeaWorld side open, making it into a wildlife area. They then changed the name of Giaga Lake to Six Flags Worlds of Adventure. In 2004, Six Flags was facing financial difficulties. They sold Giaga Lake to Cedar Fair, the owners of Cedar Point and Kings Island. Cedar Fair changed the SeaWorld side of the park, getting rid of all wildlife and remnants of SeaWorld, making it into a water park they named, Wild Water Kingdom. But over the subsequent few years, attendance fell significantly. It suddenly seemed that the Northeast Ohio market was no longer a good place for amusement parks. Cedar Fair made the monumental and heartbreaking decision to close Giaga Lake in 2007. It kept the water park open for a few more years. But even that was not successful, and they eventually closed the water park on September 5, 2016. Several Giaga Lake park rides were sold off, while some remained at the shuttered park, decaying and neglected over the years. Urban explorers were sometimes allowed into the park to take pictures of the decay, which made the park closing, even more heartbreaking. It was a blow to the area, with the loss of two parks that were once very successful. There is only speculation as to what will be put into the location where Giaga Lake and SeaWorld once stood. For now, as of the making of this video, there are no set plans, but they are contemplating creating new housing, shopping centers, and restaurants to take over those abandoned lots. Now, there are only two amusement parks left in the Northeast Ohio area. The first of the two is Memphis Kitty Park. Memphis Kitty Park opened on May 28, 1952. At the time this small amusement park opened, there were three kitty parks in the city. The other two included Euclid Beach Park and Pure Eda's Springs Park. When those two parks closed, families had to go outside Cleveland to find another kitty park, either traveling to Geauga Lake or Cedar Point for another option. 
For decades it became a rite of passage for all Cleveland children to visit Memphis Kitty Park at least once in their childhood. It was often where a Cleveland kid would get their first taste of a real amusement park ride, such as a Ferris wheel, a carousel, a train ride, a car they could drive on a pathway, a boat ride, or their first roller coaster. Today, Memphis Kitty Park is the oldest of the few remaining kitty parks in the United States. And that finally brings us to Cedar Point, the last remaining large-scale amusement park in the Northeast Ohio area. In the mid-1800s, the shoreline of Lake Erie, and the Lake Erie Islands, became popular freshwater bathing resort locations. The Cedar Point Peninsula, located close to Sandusky, Ohio, was named for its abundance of cedar trees. It was a preferred fishing spot. At that time, Sandusky had a vital shipping harbor, and two major railroads. It was a booming industrial town, where steamships went from the mainland, to the Lake Erie Islands, which included Kelly's Island, and South Bast Island, or Put-in Bay. These steamships helped to develop the tourist industry in Sandusky. During the Civil War, on nearby Johnson's Island, which was used as both an army battery, and a prison for Confederate soldiers, Louis Zistel, a German immigrant, built two boats to transport the prisoners to and from Johnson's Island. When the war ended, Zistel used his boats to ferry locals to the Cedar Point Peninsula from Sandusky. In 1870, he opened a bathhouse on the peninsula, and charged 25 cents per person, for the boat ride to the bathhouses. In 1878, another local entrepreneur, James West, opened more bathhouses on the peninsula, near the beach. Boats would also dock near the shore every summer, and people began to come to the area in droves. The growing popularity of the Cedar Point Peninsula, brought a group of developers to the area. These developers leased the land in 1882. They put in eight new bathhouses, a dance hall, and wooden walkways to the beach. Steamboats provided transportation to the resort, and to the Cedar Point Lighthouse. As the resort grew in popularity, more attractions, such as picnic tables and a baseball field were added. In 1888, a Grand Pavilion was built. The Grand Pavilion included a two-story theater, concert hall, a bowling alley, and a photography studio. The Grand Pavilion was praised and admired for its unusual architecture, and it still stands in the park today. The first amusement ride was built in 1890. It was a water toboggan ride that launched its passengers into Lake Erie. In 1891, electricity was installed at Cedar Point, and a year later, Cedar Point opened its first roller coaster, the Switchback Railroad. In 1897, the Lake Erie and Western Railroad, purchased the peninsula, and formed the Cedar Point Pleasure Resort Company. They appointed George A. Beckeling, a businessman from Indiana, as the park's manager. During Beckeling's tenure, he helped to transform what was once just a lovely picnic and beach resort, into a nationally recognized amusement park. Beckeling introduced several new and exciting rides. This included new roller coasters, and a pony track. He dredged the peninsula's swampy areas, creating a series of lagoons used for sightseeing boats, and doing this also helped to get rid of the peninsula's incessant mosquito problem. Beckeling also built the Hotel Breakers in 1905. At the time, it was one of the largest hotels in the Midwest, with 600 guest rooms, and a cafe that could seat 400 guests. Beckeling would add more rides every year, such as the Shoot the Shoots water ride, the Tilt-A-Whirl, and several fun houses. He was successful at making Cedar Point one of the most popular amusement parks in the Northeast Ohio area. Beckeling remained in charge of the park, until his health waned, in the late 1920s. He died in July 1931. Edward Smith took over Cedar Point's management. But soon after, the Great Depression almost forced the sale of the park to the state of Ohio. But somehow, park management managed to save the park, and put in extra funds towards modernizing the park's coliseum, using newer Art Deco-style architecture, and bringing in some of the more popular big bands of the era. All of these improvements helped to bring more people into the park. Food also played an essential role at the park. Cedar Point could boast of having award-winning French fries, that were made at their establishment, Mama Berardi's homemade French fry stand. The French fry stand was a fixture at the park from 1942 to 1978. More improvements were made to the park after the end of World War II. The Cedar Point Causeway was built in 1957 and is, to this day, what delivers most of the traffic to the park. In the 1960s, Cedar Point started the Pay One Price Pass. By 1960, they contemplated making the park more like Disneyland, but that idea fell through. Yet, around that time, 
they opened the Cedar Point and Lake Erie Railroad in 1963. The railroad transported passengers from the middle of the park, to the rear, and is still a popular attraction. In 1964, Cedar Point built the Blue Streak, and the Cedar Creek Mine Ride in 1969. Both roller coasters are still at the park and are still very popular with roller coaster enthusiasts. The giant Ferris wheel was built in 1972, and is a park icon to this day. The record-breaking corkscrew roller coaster opened in 1976. It was the first roller coaster to span a midway and have three inversions. In 1978, the Gemini roller coaster opened. It was, at the time, the tallest, fastest, and steepest roller coaster in the world. In the late 1980s, Cedar Point opened its first water park, which was called Soak City. It is now known as Cedar Point Shores. From 1989 to 2011, Cedar Point opened a series of record-breaking roller coasters. The first was Magnum XL200, which set records for height and speed. The first Giga Coaster, Millennium Force, opened in 2000, and in 2002, Wicked Twister opened as the tallest, fastest, and longest inverted coaster in the world. The Top Thrill Dragster was the tallest and fastest coaster in the world in 2003. And with all of these coasters and so much more, Cedar Point is considered the best roller coaster park, not just in Ohio or the United States, but in the entire world. People all over, make the trek to the park, to experience all of the roller coasters. It is a place of heaven, for all coaster enthusiasts. For over 150 years, Cedar Point has been a popular resort, and is the granddaddy of all the parks of the Northeast Ohio area, and the final remnant of a bygone era, of what had been quite a run, of excellent amusement parks. Though the good old days of amusement parks may have gone away, it is interesting to reflect on what, once was, and what the future may yet bring. Hopefully, it will include even more thrills, and even more fun, helping to enhance our long summer days, much like it had in the good old days, when amusement parks reigned in Northeast Ohio. We want to thank you for watching this episode and ask that if you liked it, please click the like and subscribe button. And also, please share this video with others, you think might enjoy and appreciate it. Thanks again, and stay tuned for more videos on the history and stories of our neighborhood.